We've now talked about money and how money is created, and we're almost ready to talk about monetary policy. But before we do that, we have to know a little bit about the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve is the U.S. Central Bank, and other countries have similar central banks. The U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, was established in 1913, but it wasn't the first U.S. Central Bank. If you've watched the musical Hamilton, you've seen how Alexander Hamilton, as Secretary of the Treasury for President Washington, intensely lobbied for the first U.S. National Bank to be established. He won that battle in opposition to Thomas Jefferson, and the first U.S. National Bank was chartered for 20 years. Then the charter ran out, there was some economic turmoil, and the second U.S. National Bank was established, again chartered for 20 years. Then Andrew Jackson became president, and he absolutely hated the central bank, so he destroyed it towards the end of its charter. Then we had a period of about 80 years when there was no central bank in the United States. During that period, U.S. monetary policy was essentially run by private banks through the private banking system. Then in 1913, the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, was established, and we've had it ever since. So what is the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve System? Well, we can begin by talking about the chair of the Federal Reserve. The chair of the Federal Reserve is appointed by the president in the middle of the presidential term for a four-year period. So each president gets to appoint a chair or reappoint the chair in the middle of their term. The reason that it was set for the middle of the term was because it was feared that the Federal Reserve was going to be too subject to political winds. And by having the appointment happen in the middle of the presidential term, it was hoped that it would not become an election issue. That appointment is subject to Senate confirmation. Then we have what we call the Board of Governors. Now these aren't governors of states, they're just called governors, and there are seven of them, and they're appointed for 14-year terms, although in practice most of them serve for only four or five years, and then resign. Then there's a vacancy, and the president gets to fill that vacancy, again subject to Senate confirmation. Then we have 12 regional Federal Reserve banks. Each bank covers one region of the country. Those banks collect lots of data on those regions, they engage in economic development policies, and they have a president. That president gets appointed by a board, a board for that bank. And that board usually consists of local business and community leaders. So we have 12 regional Federal Reserve <coughs> presidents. Together, the chair, the board of governors, and the 12 regional Federal Reserve presidents compose what we call the Federal Open Market Committee, which is also known as the FOMC. Now, the Federal Open Market Committee meets every eight weeks in Washington, D.C., and they set monetary policy. In those meetings, they vote on what monetary policy will be going forward. Now, we haven't said yet what monetary policy is, but that's how it gets determined. Who gets to vote? Well, the Board of Governors each have a permanent vote, so they vote every time. Then there are five votes from regional presidents. One of those presidents, the president of the New York Fed, always gets a vote. And that's because the New York Fed plays a special role in the Federal Reserve System that we'll talk about later. The remaining four votes by presidents of regional feds are circulated among the 11 remaining Federal Reserve Bank presidents. So those are the voters in the Federal Open Market Committee. And the reason that we have 12 presidents come up to Washington for these Federal Open Market Committee meetings, even though only five of them get to vote at each meeting, is because we want the Federal Open Market Committee to be as informed as possible about regional economic conditions. 
and the presidents of those regional Federal Reserve banks know a lot about what those conditions are. So they can bring that information to the discussion, even if during a particular meeting, some of those presidents don't get to vote. What does the Federal Open Market Committee then try to do? Well, Congress set a mandate for the Federal Open Market Committee. They said what they're supposed to do is to maximize employment and price stability. This is known as the Fed's dual mandate. What exactly that means is really up to the Federal Open Market Committee to interpret. But that is the mandate from Congress. How do they do this? Well, what the Federal Open Market Committee and the Federal Reserve System essentially tries to do is to influence financial markets through its actions. By influencing what happens in financial markets, we then see a ripple effect to the whole economy of monetary policy. And we'll talk about how exactly that happens when we get together in class.